Hey everybody, this is Mike. Welcome back to the Z Motorsports shop and channel. Uh, I hope everybody was able to uh, have a happy Thanksgiving and be able to relax, spend time with family and friends and um, kind of sit back and reminisce and be uh, uh, mindful of those things that we're all blessed with these days. So um, that being said, I kind of wanted to do another uh, Saturday morning shop tour. I believe this is going to be number three. And also, I want to show the completion, well, at least completion of phase one on my son's WJ. And please stay tuned, because as we walk around the shop, we're going to unveil the uh, big brown box that I've been keeping so secretive and introduce the next uh, project here at the Z Motorsport shop. So uh, that being said, my son's... Uh, 2004 Grand Cherokee. Uh, he bought it bone stock. He looked for a while till he found one that was exactly what he wanted, clean, um, kind of a virgin Jeep. Um, and the previous couple of tours, uh, Saturday morning shop tours, kind of took you around, kind of showed you what we were doing. Um, it's been about a, well, about a four month project, but not all that time was working on this. We did, my wife and I did take a couple of week long uh, RVing trips in there. And um, so we had some other things going on, but for the better part of probably two and a half to three months anyway, I'll bet you we've been working on this in the evenings and on weekends. So um, just to give you a little overview, uh, it's a WJ that we put uh, my old Dana 44 uh, JK front axle in, uh, the housing anyway, when I built my Pro Rock a uh, year and a half or so ago, a year or so ago, um, I bought a blank housing, took all my internals, put it into that Pro Rock, he had mentioned he wanted to do this build. He had this in his head, so he wanted to do this build. Um, rather than go out and buy a, a Dana 44 that you don't know the condition of, maybe somebody else has already bent it or uh, you know, tried, to, tried to bend it back, who knows. Mine was already sleeved, gusseted, so we have my 2011 Dana 44 housing under the front. Again, it's been sleeved, gusseted, synergy joints. Uh, he, he installed uh, the factory e-locker with 456 gears front and rear. He's running 33-inch KO2s on method wheels. Um, let's see, 10 factory chrome only front axle shafts, 8-inch uh, coil springs, which actually nets him closer to about 6.5 inches of lift because of the way the WJ spring perches were sat, sat were taller. They sat, they sat proud of the axle by about an inch and a half in comparison to the JK. Um, now, some of the other people that are doing the JK um, axle swaps, they were leaving the spring perches where they were on the JK. However, the JK perches, uh, buckets, if you will, were about about an inch and seven sixteenths, I believe it was, per side, wider. So if you look at the, the, the Jeep from the head-on view, you'll see the front coil springs kind of bow outward to mate up with the JK um, spring buckets. So we cut those off, moved them in, also corrected for some caster while we were out at it. So the springs are sitting straight up and down. We mounted bump stops internal of those springs. Uh, he's running Fox 2.0 shocks. We fabricated all of the suspension links. I think I showed that in the previous video. Uh, Terraflex uh, 2.1 version on their steering stabilizer, which we didn't put the steering stabilizer on for about the first 100 miles. He's been driving it around. We barely put the steering stabilizer on last night, I believe it was. Um, he wanted to make sure that there was no handling issues or no adverse effects uh, of anything we have done. And with the steering stabilizer on there, that can sometimes mask those problems. So we opted to leave the stabilizer off for about, like I say, he's got about 100 miles on it or so. Make sure everything was good, solid, firm, double checked everything. Um, then he went ahead and put the steering stabilizer on. Um, also, lastly, after we got the alignment done, after we went through and fine tuned everything, we go through and we paint all the heads of the bolts and the bracket that they're going through. So you can do a quick visual and you see a, you know, you see a paint mark and all of a sudden you see the, the mark offset where the nut is or, or the head of the bolt. You can, you know, quick reference, you can see that, oh, something's backing off, something's coming loose. So we've gone through and painted everything up now. So it's at the final adjustment. Um, so again, so it's, he's sitting about six and a half and six and a half total inches of lift, but even though he's running the eight inch springs, in the front. The rear is out of a 2016 JK Unlimited. It's a non-Rubicon, so it has the symmetrical axle shafts. The Rubicons have unequal length axle shafts on the rear. They are also 10 factory axle shafts. And then he's got the, the uh, Terraflex big brake kit on it for the JK. 
So he's running the uh, large, I believe, 13 and a half inch rotors on the front and 13 and a quarter, I think it is. No, 12, 12 and a half, 12 and a half on the rear, 13 and a half on the front. Um, with the dual piston calipers on the front and then on the rear it just relocates the, the uh, OEM calipers outward an extra half an inch to compensate for the one inch larger rotor. Uh, let's see, the, uh, all, the every, every, all the underneath has been painted, detailed. Um, next up, that's, that completes phase one. He's going to drive it, put some miles on it while I work on my next project. I want to get some miles on these gears. Um, I usually try to get between five and 700 miles on them and then I'd like to dump the oil out, do a twit check on everything, check the wear pattern again, uh, backlash. Generally, if you set them up properly, things don't move, but I always like to check when I do that fluid change and then we'll go ahead and put the final fill in it and go ahead and run it. Uh, but once I get my project done, he wants to build, he wants to fabricate new bumpers, front and rear, and incorporate a spare tire carrier into the rear bumper, and then also a swing away tire carrier onto the rear. So that'll be phase two, and hope, probably the final phase on this build at least for, uh, for a while. So he wants to get all that done right after I get mine done. So going into the new year, and that way hopefully next year we can spend time wheeling more rather than wrenching like we have the last several months so um i'll take you i'll grab the camera and i'll kind of put some shots underneath the jeep and kind of some different angles and then um we'll unveil my next project so again you can see it sits it sits got a really nice stance to it it's just the front end is uh, probably a quarter three-eighths of an inch higher than the rear it's kind of hard to tell in this angle but when you get outside you can definitely uh tell the front end's a little bit higher and uh, we should give a shot down underneath of the suspension here. So the front's got a Y link. You can see, like I say, where, was, where we've painted the fasteners, run extended stainless steel brake lines. Uh, we've got all the ABS sensors tied in to the W from the JK to the WJ. So the speed uh, speedometer is working correctly. All of this ABS system is working correctly. Um, coming back through. Got a, a Magnaflow muffler on it, and then there's the tri triangulated rear suspension. Got a good, about a one and a half degree pinion, negative pinion angle, so uh, no vibrations. The Tom Woods drive shafts um, work great. Big fan of Tom Woods drive shafts. He's been building my drive shafts for a long time now, and uh, had really good luck. Gonna give you a rear angle view here looking forward. Like I say the tires are uh, 33 inch BF Goodrich KO2s um, wrapped around 17 by 9 method wheels. Uh, my KO2s on my Jeep are getting down there. Um, I have about 48,000 driven miles on mine and then I've towed it probably another 20,000 over the last four years so mine are getting up there in miles um i might have a few thousand left on them so uh i'll be looking at new tires after the first of the year all right so i'll quit stalling and move on to uh my next project so this is my next project um this is uh my passion, uh, jeeping, we've, uh, we've had this now, um, bought this, it's a 2011, we bought it in late 2011, I'm not the original owner, it had 3,000 miles on it when I bought it. The gentleman I bought it from wanted a 2012 with the Pentastar and the 5 speed when it first came out, so I got a pretty decent deal on this because he wanted out from under it quick. Um, it was bone stock when I got it, um, other than he had a cold air intake on it, and let's see what else, cold air intake on it. I think that was about it. Um, he had wheeled it in Moab one time, got back and decided he wanted the Pentastar. So I got it, um, lifted it, did all the work to this chassis and everything. Um, and then my other videos that I've got on my channel, you can go back and check those all out, has shown the progression like every other, every other Jeep, everybody's Jeep out there. They're never a finished project. They're always in a evolution. They always are, are, are evolving into something else. Um, this drivetrain has pretty much been where I've left it for the last little while. Um, 
I've got a four inch lift under it. My rear springs are starting to sag a little bit, but it has, like I said, 90, uh, about 92,000 miles on it now, and I've towed it probably 40,000 over the last seven years I've owned it. We've traded it a little bit, but generally it's flat towed. So um, I'm going to, when I do my gear, I'm, I'm gonna switch over and put four, I've got 538 gears in it now, but she's getting a new power, new powertrain. So uh, the 3.8 has never been, I've never been impressed with the 3.8. I've just put up with it. Um, that's one of the reasons why I haven't gone anything bigger than 35s. Uh, I know a lot of people run 37s with this engine and they, they seem fine, happy with it. Maybe not happy with it, but they're okay with it. Personally, I'm barely okay with the 35s and I've got plenty of lift to be able to run the 37s. Um, but I've just never took that step because I don't want to hurt performance any more than it already is. The 538s brought that performance back a little bit. Um, it's been adequate. It'll go down the freeway most of the time with the cruise control on at 70 and, and get reasonable economy. I get 15-ish or so miles a gallon. Um, it wheels fine off-road. I have no complaints really because when you're in four low, it, 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 does, it does beautifully. Um, it's just mostly my daily driving and getting to and from the trails and it'd be nice to have a little extra power out on the trails. So we are going to put a LS 6.2 liter all aluminum 400 plus horsepower LS V8 engine into my 2011 JK Unlimited Rubicon. So we're also going to be installing a 6L80 GM transmission. I, I love that combination. Um, I've I've wanted to do that for quite a while. I've just never, I should say never, with, the, with building, with moving the house, the sh building the shop, putting the yard in the last two years, I've kind of been preoccupied with other things. Um, I started collecting all the pieces and parts over the summer. Um, and I've got, I think I've got everything I need now. I told my son we'd get his done first. Once his was on the road, then I'd go ahead and tear into mine. So I lucked out and, um, found a crate engine so i've got a l94 which again is a 6.2 come in the escalades the denali's i believe they put it in the silverados it's a 10 through 14 that's what i have to use in this to make it viable for a us epa compliant uh engine swap so i'm going to be running i, I bought a brand new gm wiring harness so this is going to be a a uh fully integrated system into the jeep or the chrysler uh body and train basic basically i it i want the cat i want it the cadillac feel of the engine transmission performance and everything i want that cadillac feel i'm even running right down to the hydraulic motor mounts everything i want that cadillac feel but with like a jeep body on it so that's what we're getting ready to do that's what the big surprise was um i think what i'm going to do is i'm going to do a multi series uh, video of when we're doing it because i'm going to lift the body right off the frame i'm going to strip everything out of it i'm going to Pressure wash, clean up the frame, uh, motor and transmission and transfer case are about ready to go in it. All my wiring I have pretty much ironed out. So I've, uh, it's basically going to be going, to, going together hopefully fairly quick. I'm hopefully maybe a couple week project is all. Um, before I get to that, I mentioned I have 538 gears in this with 35s. Yes, I am going to be stepping to 37s as soon as this uh, engine is done. And this engine likes to be in the, around the 2,000 RPM range at 70. So I've calculated it out. I'm going to be running 456s in my front and rear axles. So I'm going to go ahead and re-gear and put 456s in it so that once I get the engine and everything done, then I can go ahead and drive it and I won't have to, I won't be over uh, revving the engine so, the new engine so high and trying to break everything in. I will actually break, be breaking gears in a little bit while I'm driving it in between doing the gears so um that being said let's uh there's there's not a lot of details to it i mean well there are a lot of details to it but i won't go into a lot of deep more any more details to it other than saying that i'm going to put this engine and transmission into the jeep and go, jump up to 37s uh, oh one other thing i'm actually going to be pulling my uh, i did a video a while back i'm putting the psc xd2 gearbox in the jeep it's performed great, I love it. Off-road, on-road, doesn't matter. It handles these 35s great, and I'm sure it would handle the 37s fine. But it's such a physically large box, I can't fit that in there and accommodate 
my AC compressor because it's right encroaching right in the area where I want to put my uh, factory JK AC compressor back down in. So I'm going to be putting my, reinstalling my, my factory steering gear box that I've had West Texas off-road uh, port and tap it. And I bought their one and a half inch RAM and I'm going to be running hydro assist on it. I want it, the reason why I'm only going with one and a half inch is I want, this is again, this is my daily driver. I want to keep it very streetable, very drivable. Um, I just want a little extra help turning those, well, eventually 37s when I'm wheeling. I don't lock up very often, um, but when I do, I want to be able to turn, I want to be able to steer the thing. So um, let me uh, go ahead and pull the cover off this box and then I'll take you a walk around and show you the other components. Uh, for the build. Easier said than done. So there it is, 6.2 liter, all aluminum, L94 General Motors engine. So it's brand new crate motor, zero miles on it. Come with the, all, I mean, right down to the injectors, coil packs, spark plugs. Um, it's a complete crate engine. Um, the reason why I went with the L94 versus the LS3, that's the Corvette engine, um, well, Cor Corvette and the Camaro engine, they're about a 430 horse, and this is a 403 horse. Um, the LS3 is a little taller, or excuse me, a little shorter. This has a taller manifold on it. I kind of like that for, I like this engine for a couple of reasons. Number one, the taller intake manifold, more low end torque. This is in the, uh, the, the trucks and the SUVs, like they say, the Denali's, Escalades. <coughs> and so forth and it also has vvt so it's discrete vvt meaning it's not it's not continuous um at idle it will advance the cam to keep your cylinder pressure up and then about 3000 rpm it retards it and it gives you kind of another sudden boost of uh, bump, uh, bump of in power there but this engine uh it was made for torque so i think it'll perform beautifully in my uh, about 6,000 pound JK and still net me some reasonable fuel economy. Um, so that's why I went with this one. It, now, the L, this, this is a, an evolution of the L92. The L92 was in the seven and eight uh, high end. Like I say, your Denali's Escalade and so forth. Um, same, same horsepower, same size, same, same basic engine. Um, and then in 09, they went to the L9H, which they introduced flex fuel to it. And so they changed out injectors, um, fuel rail, a few different odds and ends to allow it to handle the flex fuel. In 2010, they, trans, they, they went to the L94, which they added AFM. Um, you can call it DOD, displacement on demand. Air, they call it, General Motors calls it AFM, air fuel management. Um, basically what it does is it, um, in low load, it will knock, a, it, it'll use oil pressure to shift a pin in your uh, in in the lifters and turn half your engine and basically to an air pump and uh, or an air spring rather and only runs on four cylinder. Now it worked pretty decent in these vehicles stock. However, as heavy as this thing is and with the larger rolling resistance of the tires, the you know brick. It's not the most aerodynamic vehicle. I'm going to disable the AFM. Um, I've I've talked to a few people that have been running it. And in the Gen 5 engines, it's a totally different, it, it, it works well in the Gen 5 engines. In the Gen 4s, um, it just doesn't hold it. So you're constantly going in and out of that AFM. So I'm just going to turn it off in the uh, ECM. But I, I, I wanted, like I said, I wanted this because of the, uh, the variable valve timing and the taller, longer runners on the intake manifold. The downside to the all aluminum 6.2 is it does require, you know, your synthetic oils, the Dexos. Um, oil, so you're going to pay a little bit more oil changes, and it requires premium fuel, so I'll be running premium fuel in this. 
Um, the, the good side of that is, is it does net you some more horsepower and it does generally return a little better economy. So I'm gonna hold off my feelings on the economy until I get it up and running. I have uh, high aspiration, aspirations that it's going to net me some, at least as good a mileage, if not better than what I'm getting. I can tell my engine right now, at little 3.8, on the little rollers going down the interstate, I can tell it's um, going, into, uh, going into fuel enrichment mode, um, where I don't think this engine is gonna be doing that. So it's gonna get, get this vehicle down the road easier, lower RPM, right now it's 70, I'm turning 26, 2650. This thing I calculated it out on a 37 inch tire. I'm gonna say, I think I calculated it at 35 and three quarters being conservatively, being conservative. It was like 2,040 RPM. So this engine, 19 to 20, 1,900 to 2,100 is kind of the sweet spot. So I'll be right in the middle at 70. I generally don't travel over that anyway. So um, this is, like I say, this is going to be my uh, new power plant. Hopefully I can get, you know, a couple hundred thousand miles out of it. 15 years down the road, I'm still driving it. And uh, we will uh, commence this project. I'll uh, go for a walk around the shop and show some of the other parts okay, now. Okay, so moving around the shop here, I have a CSF uh, 52 millimeter dual pass aluminum radiator. Um, that I'm going to be running in it. I also purchased a 20, uh, I believe it's 2018 Camaro SS fan. Um, it's an uh, outside. It's, it's not. It's a brushless motor, um, so it's got it'll, it'll it's a pulse width modulated fan. It's going to pull the air through more efficiently and more controlled than either the Pentastar or and definitely the uh, 3.8 liter fan. And then also I've picked up from uh, GM a manual transmission AC condenser. My thinking was is I'm I'm already running a 20 I think it's a like a 25,000 pound capacity stack plate transmission cooler and in these AC in the automatic AC condensers down at the very bottom it's very small is where they put the transmission cooler um, while I've got everything out uh, refitting everything and mocking everything and back up into the body um, I'm just going to go ahead and put the manual transmission so it just gives me that little extra cooling capacity down at the bottom. It doesn't do really do anything for the automatic transmission anyway. And then I'll just run discreetly right to, for my transmission, right to my uh, already existing transmission cooler. And coming around, here is, this is really the kind of uh, unsung hero of these uh, GM packages. It's the 6L80 transmission. Um, this has got this, this. This will make this thing perform beautifully on and off road. Um, there's so many features of this transmission, just uh, separate from just having six gears. It has a lower low and a higher high than the 42 RLE that's in my Jeep now. Um, the 42 RLE has a 2.8 first gear and a 0.69 overdrive. This transmission has a 4.02 first gear and two overdrives ending in 0.667. So it's um, about 30, was that 34% overdriven? Um, so it's going to allow me a little bit lower RPM and a lot deeper first gear taking off. So that in, com in combination with my uh, oh, uh, 456 gears, I ought to make this thing pretty snappy running around the streets. And then when I go into four low, I'm going back to a 2.72 to one transfer case. Um, I'll still have my roughly 11 or so to one first gear in, which is similar to what I have now with the 2.8 42RLE and the 241OR transfer case. So, um, like I said, I just went ahead and took the, tra the TCM out, sent it to Robbie at MoTeC along with my ECM. He programmed them, matched everything up. Um, they have what they call uh, oh, VCM um, here for emissions. So it has to check your vehicle ca uh, calibration numbers. So they'll plug in and make sure, because the, the, excuse me, the transmission is just as, as integral part of the emission system as anything on the engine. So that way, that way everything will be passed. It'll be pure GM on the uh, drive, on the powertrain side. Um, I went ahead and removed the GM transmission transfer case adapter. It was set up for, I'm assuming probably the 263 transfer case. Uh, and I put the Atlas, excuse me, the advanced adapters 
adapter on that goes from the 6L80 to the Atlas transfer case, which happens to be the same bolt pattern as a 241J. Now, if you have a two-wheel drive, if, you were, if you're doing the swap and you get a two-wheel drive transmission, you can still make it work. You change out the adapter and you just have to cut the output shaft off and then down inside, there's a plug there and a, and a corresponding one up top and then this seal you'll have to put in. Um, let's say this was already out of a four-wheel drive, it was out of a 2012 Cadillac Escalade, so it already has all that. Um, I went ahead and changed the seal while I was in there, but I've gone ahead and put the um, advanced adapters, uh, GM to Atlas uh, adapter on there. Um, this can probably just go away after, I don't need that, I just have it sitting there. Funny thing, this heat shield, when I bought this transmission out of the salvage yard, this transmission only has 38,000 miles on it. Uh, I tried to buy the engine as well, but the engine was already spoken for. So um, I was kind of bummed at the time, but I figured, well, I'll take the transmission. It's the year range I'm looking for. And then I stumbled across that crate motor, the L94 crate motor, and it worked out great because now I got the crate motor, I got a really good deal on it, and it has zero miles on it. So it uh, kind of worked out for the best. But that heat shield, when I went to pick it up, I asked the salvage yard, I'm like, hey, the uh, heat shield that was on this, I uh, need to pick that up. And he says, oh, there wasn't one. Yeah, I kind of called BS on that. I know there was one, but they uh, didn't give it with me. Give it to me with the transmission. I looked at the in the thread in the screw holes, and they were they were fairly clean. So I know they had a bolt in them, but they, and they, I'm sure they took it out, set it aside, and lost it. But that heat shield has probably taken me long, harder. That's probably been harder to acquire that heat shield right there than any of the other components I've been sourcing. That took me five weeks to get that heat shield once I was able to find the numbers. GM had a hard time finding the number. When they did find the number, they told me it was discontinued. I found another number off of an uh, internet website. I think it was a Camaro. I believe it was a Camaro forum. I found a number and I called GM and that's kind of how I ended up going about it. I found, gave them that number. They said it superseded to this number, but then they said it was on national back order. So five weeks later, it, like I said, it just showed up a couple weeks ago, so that was one of my last pieces of the puzzle. It probably, I probably don't, it's not necessary, it's not, you know, an integral part of the swap, but I'm trying to make this as OE as possible, and I want everything OE level um, when it goes into my Jeep. I don't plan on selling this anytime soon, I want it to last many, many years. So, I figured I'm going to go ahead and spend the money and put the parts in it that should be on it. So, that's the Transmission ready to go in it. Um, coming around here, here's my box of GM parts. I've got exhaust manifolds. Um, the engine has exhaust manifolds off of NL94, but I've found out that they're not usable because they hit the uh, frame. So I ended up buying 2000, like eight or, I think it was like 2008 Trailblazer with the V8 6.0. I bought those manifolds because they tuck in and back so I can build my exhaust off of it. Um, then I've got my standard, I went with a heavy duty transmission, uh, rubber mount, um, heat shields for the exhaust manifolds, uh, my belts, a bunch of GM nuts and bolts, and I mean I'm even using the, the, the bell housing bolts, the correct bell housing bolts and studs that this, this engine should have come with. I bought all those. Um, I am going to change the fuel pump, this is a brand new Mopar. Um, fuel pump that I'm going to put in the Jeep while I've got the body off. It has 90, like I said, it has 92,000 miles, which isn't a ton, but it's enough to where I'm right there. I'm going to go ahead and change the fuel pump. Coming around over here, here's all my goodies that are going to be going on it. Uh, I'm going to uh, replace my rear axle shafts, put some chromoly 10 factory um, axle shafts in the rear. Oh, here's my Curry. Um, dual rate rear springs. I have BDS springs under it now. Like I say, they've really sagged a lot in the last year, 16 months, something like that. So I'm going to be replacing those and try to get the thing leveled back out a little bit. It's sagging something, something fierce. Um, let's see, I bought a builder, just a, some random oh, angles and bends and so forth, and a, a single chamber muffler for my exhaust system. I'll have to build once I get the Jeep. Once I get everything back together and get it up in the air. Oh, and I've got some other parts some pieces here. Factory uh, dipsticks for the engine transmission, transmission lines, uh, my HP tuners. 
um, tuners. I'm going to use some exhaust clamps. Uh, I think my ECM, no, that's in my air filter. I'm with my air filter that's in this box. Uh, another box of parts. Let's see, coming around over here, some uh, hoses. The hoses I bought, have they're 5 8 heater hoses, but they're 90 degrees on the end, so I'll be able to go into the firewall and then come off and wrap around. And I bought some longer ones. I think these are 60 inch, so I can just cut them to the size as I need them. But while I'm right, like I say, while again, while I'm right there, 92,000 miles, I'm going to go ahead and replace my heater hoses. There's all my O2 sensors, upstream and downstream, uh, factory, GM, AC Delco. Um, one other thing while I'm at it, I mentioned I was going to be putting the... Uh, um, hydraulic steering on it. I went ahead and bought the Arctic Industries uh, raised track bar. I'm going to flip my drag link and go ahead and put that bracket, cut the old, cut the factory Pro Rock bracket off and run the Arctic bracket so that I can not only flip my, uh, my drag link up and run my track bar tall or higher to match the uh, angle, I'll also, it will also give me a good solid locating point for um, my hydraulic ram and let's see coming around over here a few parts for my son's jeep still that he's got all of services transmission and a few little odds and ends some other parts that he just went ahead and kept the old parts temporarily until he makes sure everything's okay and then he'll discard them here is my transfer case it's a uh, 241 j out of 2008 I believe this was out of a Sahara. I picked it up out of. It has just under 50,000 miles. I guess it had 48,000 on the odometer on it. So um, here's my advanced adapters input gear that I need to replace. The 241, the Jeep 241J has a 23 spline input that will not mate with the GM 6L80. So this is advanced adapters um, input gear. It has 30, the correct 32 spline. Um, same OD and everything as the 241J, so I just have to tear the transmission apart and go ahead and replace that gear. And then on the back side here, uh, I've just got this setting on there right now, but it's the Tom Woods output flange. I'm going to be running a 1350 series U-joint rear drive shaft on this. So I'll, I'll stick with the 1310 front due to clearance issues, but in the rear I'm going to run the 1350 to handle a little extra power. Lastly, here is the my, my factory gearbox I sent back to West Texas off-road. I had them port it and tap it for hydraulic steering. Um, if you're going to do this swap, make sure you tell them you're going to be putting an LS in it because they will um, port it differently than if, the, if it's going on a stock JK. Uh, if, you, if, you put it, if, you, if you don't tell them and they port it, it'll actually put the fittings right out into the AC compressor. So they need to port it. They port it differently so that it, you can run the lines around your AC compressor and it won't interfere with anything. And then they've got good quality hoses and just a one and a half inch um, ram that I'll have to uh, mount onto my axle and tie rod. Okay, so that pretty much concludes my little uh, Saturday morning shop tour. And uh, I appreciate you following along. I appreciate all the, uh, the uh, teasing and bantering about the uh, big brown box. But I uh, appreciate all the, the, the comments and the... Uh, um, all the, like I say, the bantering back and forth, especially over on Garage Journal. I've gotten quite a few, quite a bit of it lately, but uh, that's the project that's coming up. I hope, I hope it intrigues it, everybody. And I'm, like I said, I'm going to be doing a, a series of videos, kind of going step, not maybe not step by step, but the different segments of the build. Um, I'm probably not going to do the gears and the axles because I've already got a couple of videos of that out there. But the first week and a half or so, I'm going to be doing my hydro assist steering. And my gears and the axles, pretty straightforward. Um, when it gets down to actually lifting the body and doing the transplant, um, I'll definitely be filming that and probably break it up into categories or sub subsections. Um, unless you guys want to see more gears and more uh, hydro assist steering videos, if you do, you know, let me know in the comments if you want to see that as well. I can include that. Um, I also want to thank uh, a lot of my new subscribers. I've got a lot of new subscribers, and I want to thank my longtime subscribers. Um, I hope this is this this series. I hope this is, is intriguing to everybody. Uh, I want to be able to show that this is something that probably the average guy can do with some, uh, you know, just some 
knowledge, and that's all I'm trying to do is arm everybody with, with the knowledge to do this. If they've got a Jeep and they want to put an LS in it, um, it's possible. So I hope this series goes well, and I hope everybody likes it. If you like it, give me a thumbs up, and I welcome the comments, and thank you very much for watching.